Good morning, Bethlehem family. It is good to be with you all today and have this fourth week of doing services different. And we just want to welcome you to the services today and say thank you. We love you. We miss you and hope to see you again very soon. There are ways for you to connect this week and ways for you to have other resources while you're at home still. Uh, Parents, you should have already received an email uh, from our children's ministry uh, regarding some videos for your children to watch from their Sunday school teachers. Uh, You've been also, some of you have already been receiving from your classes, uh, your digital Sunday school quarterlies, and so those are available for you as well. If you need that, you can let us know. You can uh, email me or you can call the church uh, or call my cell phone, uh, and just we'll get that to you. We love for you to be able to continue to be discipled and still to grow even while you're at home. And we know we've got several Sunday school classes today and during the week that will be meeting over online uh, through Zoom. And so if you would like to join in on one of those, you can also just let me know, email me or call me again. And there are ways for you to continue to connect this week. Uh, This coming week, you can meet with us during this week online. Um, And so on Tuesday evening, Pastor Fox will have a devotional uh, up that will be available on Facebook and uh, also on YouTube. And so that's there for you to check out. On Wednesdays and Sundays, the youth, uh, Pastor Jordan, is still sending out messages and videos on Instagram and YouTube for the youth. And so we encourage you to check those out. On Thursday at 1230, you can... uh, Come join us on Facebook Live for praying with the pastors. Uh, and so that'll be a time for us just to you to join us in prayer for different things as we're at home doing, and, and some of us still at work, uh, just to go through what is, uh, and praying through what is happening in our country. But we also want you to know about this week, there's something special. This week is, our, is Holy Week, and so Monday, Thursday service this week will still be happening, but we're going to be live streaming that. And so that'll be Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m. You can get it on the website, you can get it on Facebook Live, and we'll probably post it after that on YouTube. And so that'll be there for you to check out. Later this month, on April the 24th, on a Friday, uh, from 1.30 to 6 p.m., we are making available our Christian Life Center uh, for the American Red Cross to come and donate blood and uh, take for a blood drive. And so if you would like to be a part of that, if you would like to give blood, you can register for that online at the American Red Cross. And so we are doing everything we can to make sure that the Christian Life Center is sanitized before that, and we're going to make sure that social distancing takes place during that time, and that even after the event, we're going to re-sanitize the entire building, make sure everything's good and clean and ready for us, uh, for when we're able to gather back together as a family. And so we would just want you to know that today um, is a good day. Today is a holy day. Today is the day that God has given us. Today is the day that we are given here to worship. And so this morning as we gather together, we just want you to rid yourself of distractions. Prepare yourselves even for this. Uh, this time of at home with your families or watching wherever you're at. And just gather around and pray. There are also some videos on the YouTube channel um, for you, a playlist for videos for you to watch and, and worship songs for you to continue and worship with today. And so those are there, they're available for you as well. We also uh, want you to know that you can continue to give your tithes and your offerings. You can mail those to the church. You can give online through our church website. You can download the Tithely app and give through Tithely. Or you can just set up an automatic deposit through your bank. We also want you to know that this week, that even while the offices are closed, we have put out a secure lockbox outside of the office doors. And so if you still want to drop something off at the church securely, that can go in that secured lockbox outside the front doors. But... Today, we also want to know that if there are any needs that you have, please let us know. Let us know how we can still minister to you. As schools this week are having to close down because of the spread of the virus more, there's going to be a greater, greater need this week uh, for people with children, especially to have meals. It's because people are more and more out of work these couple of days, these, over these weeks as well. So we encourage you, check on others, call others. If there is a need, let us know. You can email us at needs at BethlehemNightdale.com. We'd love to be able to figure out a way that we can minister and be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? Counseling and loving others is going to be so important during this time. So reach out to people. Just talk to them and love on them and encourage them. Today, we just want to start our service with prayer. So let's pray. Father, God, we come to you, and Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you, Lord, for the time, God, that we have set now. God, a time, Father, where your people, God, can still be the body of Christ. God, we are united, Father, not by a building and bricks and mortars, 
But God, we are united, Father, by your Spirit because you, Lord, gave your life for us and bought us. Bought us back from our sin. Bought us back, Father, by giving your life, Father, on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. God, you became our righteousness. You took upon yourself our sin. And God, you stand even now at the, at the foot of the Father, beside the Father, just there, Father, pleading on our behalf as our righteousness, letting all the eternity, all the world know, all of creation know that you have bought us and purchased us. And God, we thank you, Lord, for what you've given and what you've sacrificed for us, Lord. And we pray that today, Lord, as we worship, Lord, that we would be able to reflect and to understand the beauty, Father, of what it is you have done for us. God, this is a holy time, Father, for many believers around the world. God, for your church, Lord. God, just to speak truth into the world. And so, Father, we pray and ask, God, that we, Lord, would be a representation, Lord, of your righteousness. God, as we praise your name and sing praises to you, Lord, and hear, word, and hear the word from you. So, Lord, we just pray and ask, God, that you would be glorified today, Father, through all the messages that will be shared online or at drive-in churches or in small homes, in small gatherings. So, Lord, we just pray and ask, God, that you would be glorified in the world. It's in your precious Son's name we pray, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. And now we have a video of a worship song that Pastor Fox and Pastor Jordan recorded earlier this week. And so we just want to share that with you. So join us and watch. I want to sing a song for you this morning. It's one of my favorites. It's called All I Have is Christ. You know, today on Palm Sunday, as we remember how Jesus came into Jerusalem that Passover week with crowds praising him, that in a very short while he was with his disciples in the upper room, took the Last Supper, and then went out to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was betrayed by Judas. He was arrested, and we remember that then there was the mock trial, and Jesus was crucified on that cross for my sins and your sins. I want to ask you this morning, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? You know, we can serve a lot of things in this life. We can chase after a lot of pleasures that are enjoyable for a while. But in the end, they do not deliver what they promise. So I just want to say to you this morning, you know, the Bible tells us that all that confess their sin and confess Jesus as Savior and Lord shall be saved. And when you have Jesus, you truly have all you need, not only for now, but for all eternity. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and light led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you. And as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And there beheld your love displayed, you suffered in my Place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Alleluia. All I have is Christ. Alleluia. Jesus 
is my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all may see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, you my ransomed life in any way you choose and may my song forever be my only hope is you This morning, we continue with our worship as we gather to hear a message from the Lord on this great holy day of Palm Sunday. And now, our pastor, Pastor George Fox. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you all today online on this Palm Sunday, and I hope that you have your Bibles with you. Uh, if not, maybe your iPad or something that you can look up. And we're going to be looking today at the topic of being on the right side of the cross. I'd like for you to join me, if you would, by turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, and we'll be beginning in just a moment with verse uh, 32 after our prayer. Uh, but I wanted to say this as well. Last Sunday, I began a, a little series that I hope will be helpful to you on praying in your crisis from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I want you to practice the things that we talked about last week for the next two weeks. And then the Sunday after Easter, we'll be uh, doing a part two on that and learning what we can expect as we pray that way how God will respond. But today as we think about Holy Week and we think about how on that uh, Palm Sunday Jesus entered Jerusalem as I've already said in my song and how uh, that then there was the arrest and the mock trial and then the crucifixion. I want us to focus on the cross because literally the cross changes everything for those that believe in Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 8 that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. And it also tells us that since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we live who have been saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were enemies, God, who were in, God's enemies were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? As I said before my song, I pray today, that you've received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and that if you haven't today, as we talk about the cross, I pray that you will make the decision to respond rightly to what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. We're going to see in this passage of Scripture that there were two men, one on either side of Jesus, that were crucified at the same time. God could have easily let Jesus be on one side and the other two to his left or to his right, but God in his sovereignty arranged that Jesus would be in the center. And it's a picture of how that all of us as sinners come before the cross and we all have a decision, what are we going to do with Jesus? What are we going to do with the cross? And we see in this passage, as we'll see today, that both of these men were guilty. Both of them were condemned. Both of them desired to be rescued. But only one made the right response and was saved. The other one died eternally condemned and out of the presence of God for all eternity. So look along with me, and then we'll pray and get started this morning. It tells us there 
that there were two others who were criminals who were led away to be put to death with him. And they came to the place that is called the skull. And there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him. He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, if he is the chosen one, they said. And then the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription above him that said, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hanged there railed at him and said, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 42, and he said, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Father, as we come to you today, we know that many of those watching today are already believers, already know Jesus as their Savior, and have already decided what they will do in response to the cross. But I pray for them, Lord, that on this Palm Sunday more than ever and in this Holy Week that their hearts would be gripped with what a beautiful treasure they have in Christ. And that they would be reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus took on the cross upon Himself for their sins. That He suffered, that He died, that He took the very wrath of God, not only the painful crucifixion, upon Himself in their place. But I pray today also, Lord, for those that are in that valley of decision those who have not yet made the decision to follow Christ, that in the midst of all the fearful things going on around us, as those two men on either side of Jesus were going through a fearful thing, that we would look to the right place, that we would look to the crucified Lord who bore our sins and make the right choices, that we would be absolutely sure before this day is out, that we'd responded rightly and that we become citizens of His kingdom, forgiven men, women, boys, and girls, born again, with the true gift of salvation. Father, I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Today we ask the question, what was it about the man that made the right decision? How was it that he was saved and the other was not? How can we be sure that we have true saving faith? And there are three things that I want to share with you from this passage. And the first of those is this, is that genuine saving faith in Jesus. Number one, is marked by a humbling, holy fear of God. By a humbling, holy fear of God. I want you to look at the first part of this in verse 35 and following down for a little bit before the one thief who becomes repentant speaks. And I want you to hear how there's all this mocking, all this arrogance going on towards Jesus who is giving his life and taking the wrath of God upon himself for them. And the people are just you know, not fearing God at all. It tells us that all the people stood by watching. Now, some of those included Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, and others there who were, who were weeping and who were torn of heart, and they were not mocking. But there were others, the rulers, it says, they, they're scoffing him, and they're saying things like, well, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, if he's the chosen one. And you can just hear the ridicule. You can hear the shame and the mocking in their voice. There's, there's no fear of God. And there's no humility towards Jesus. There's no brokenness over their sin and over their need. And then even the soldiers join in. And they're mocking him and they give him sour wine to drink and they say, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There's the inscription over him that's meant to mock him, but actually it's quite prophetic and quite true. King of the Jews. And he was the king of the Jews. And then there was the other criminal, the one who never repented. And he railed at him, he scoffed him. And he said, are you not the Christ? Save us. Save yourself. 
you know, all he's interested in is what Jesus can do for him in that moment. I want to say to you this morning, that's not the way to live. We face a crisis right now in this nation, but many of you faced crisis before that. Many of you have problems that I can't even begin to understand going on in your homes and your marriages and your life. And we talked about how to pray for those things last week, and God truly cares. But I want to say to you this morning, we don't need to be preoccupied with only what Jesus can do for us in the moment. That's being short-sighted. And these people were arrogant, but now listen in verse 40. Something is happening in the heart of this other thief. We know from the Gospel of Matthew that prior to this, that man had mocked Jesus as well. But something's changed in his heart. Listen in verse 40. He looks at the thief on on the other side of Jesus who's been mocking Jesus, and he says he rebuked him. And he said, do you not fear since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? You know, in the Bible in John Three, the Bible tells us God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and as we think about that, we remember that Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. He came to rescue us from condemnation. And somehow this thief, the one that's repentant, has a holy fear of God. He's humbling himself before God. The Bible says that in 1 Peter chapter 5, God's, God opposes the proud. Those who are arrogant, those who are prideful, God is opposing them. But God gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. This repentant thief humbled himself before the crucified Jesus. And he's going to receive grace. And I wonder today, have you humbled yourself before the crucified Jesus? As we think about that, I know that both of these men's hearts were filled with fear. And one is railing against Jesus, and he hasn't got a fear of God. He has a fear of losing everything in his life. And many today, with all that's going on, are afraid of losing their bank accounts and losing their homes or losing their health. And all those fears are real. But the thing they weren't afraid of was the judgment to come. You see, this man who has the fear of God, he knows he's about to die, but he also, he is not preoccupied with that because at the moment, his physical death, the repentant thief, is not his greatest concern. You see, at the moment, this repentant thief has a holy fear of God and and he realizes that he's facing death eternally unprepared. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, it's appointed unto every man or person once to die, and after that, the judgment. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, Do not be afraid of him who can kill the body, but cannot kill your soul. Instead, fear him, that's God, who can kill and destroy both the body and the soul in hell. I want to say to you this morning, there are three different kinds of fear. Sometimes people react to saying fear of God, and they say, Oh, I don't want us to fear God. You shouldn't be promoting fear of God. It's the right kind a fear of God that this repentant thief had. You see, there are harmful fears in this life, harmful fears. And harmful fears are debilitating. They hinder our walk with God. And they're the kind of fears that Paul talked about when he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 to Timothy. And he said, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. And that's the kind of fear that we should walk in. You know, those are the, those are, we want the kind of fear that's the fear of God, not the fear of rejection or insecurity or inadequacy. That's the kind of fear that, that God had not given Timothy. God wants us to have the holy fear of God. And see, there are healthy fears as well. And healthy fears safeguard us when our children are little. We want to teach them to have holy fear. We want to teach them that they need to turn away from playing in the street because it's dangerous. We want to teach them, don't touch the hot eye on top of the stove because you can get burned. And that's a, that's a healthy fear. Then there's also a holy fear. And that's what's gripping the heart of this repentant thief. Proverbs, 19, Proverbs 9, 16 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that kind of fear is what God wants us to have. You know, the others, they were arrogant. They were prideful. They were mocking Jesus. There was no holy fear of God. There was no humility. and Therefore, they weren't saved. When I was a young man and I worked for the government many years ago, uh, I had a buddy that told me that he had been pulled over for speeding. 
and that uh, he had taken out his government credentials, which we had at that time for our job, and he sort of flipped them out to the, pridefully to the police officer, and he said, Sir, I know it was going a little bit fast, but I'm on official government business. So I know you'll understand. And he said that the police officer looked at him and said, Okay, go ahead, sir. Well, I got pulled over for speeding. So what did this young, arrogant, not then pastor, but a young, arrogant guy do? I flipped out my credentials. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, Sir, I know it's going a little bit fast, but I know you'll understand I'm on official government business. Well, the police officer looked right back at me, and he said, I do understand, and I'm on official government business as well. Here's your ticket. Have a nice day. You see, I was arrogant. Now, if I had approached that police officer with some humility, if I had recognized my need for mercy, I might have got a different response, and I might not. But here, all these people are approaching Jesus with arrogance, no fear of God, no humility, and they're not going to receive that. You know, Matthew tells us this guy had heard old insults at Jesus, but something's changed. What brought about this fear of the Lord? Well, I believe it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was working in his heart through the things that he saw because when they were first nailed to the cross, he just thought, you know, he's just like us. He's just a criminal like the rest of us. And they, they didn't think anything about mocking him. But when they saw Jesus on his cross being mocked and ridiculed, he didn't revile back. And then they heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I believe the Holy Spirit brought a holy fear of God into this repentant thief's heart to think, what kind of person can forgive in this situation? What kind of person doesn't strike back? Certainly certainly not me, he thought to himself. And he saw a holiness about Jesus. Have you ever been in the presence of somebody that was really holy? This man was feeling that. And so the second thing is this, as you think about, you know, do you have that, hum- that humble, holy fear of God, and have you cried out for mercy as this man? The second thing is genuine saving faith in Jesus always is marked, number two, by confessing your sin and Jesus' righteousness. By confessing your sin and Jesus' righteousness. Look at verse 41 with me there. And we, this repentant thief is saying, and we indeed justly, are receiving this punishment is what he's saying. And we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. What does it mean to confess? It means to agree with God. And so to confess our sin is to agree with God that we're sinners, that we're lost, that we're children of wrath under condemnation, that our sin is not just having made a little mistake, that our sin is outright defiance, it's rebellion against God. It's deserving of eternal separation from God because that's what it brings. Our our sin brings that. And the best that we can do, the Bible says, is is filthy rags. You know, God's not going to judge our sin based on, well, you know, you did a lot of good things and you did a lot of bad things and you did more good things than bad things. It outweighs it, so welcome into heaven. No, no, no. We have to be perfect and holy and righteous. And there's no way we can be except to have a perfect and holy, righteous substitute. And so when he says this man has done nothing wrong, he's confessing that Jesus is that sinless Lamb of God that John spoke about in John chapter 1 when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's confessing his sin. He's confessing Jesus' righteousness. And he's putting his trust in the one whose righteousness who died in his place. You know, when you think about, you know, how... This came about, this sense of conviction and the sense of the righteousness of Jesus being so great and his, his own righteousness being so sinful and so dark. I just can't uh, think of great illustrations, but I remember that uh, many times I like to paint and do home improvement projects. A lot of times I do them under pressure because I don't have a lot of time. Many times I painted a room or maybe worked on sheetrock and I am late in the evening finishing it and I have the lights on and I think it looks really good and I go ahead after I've done the sheetrock work and sanded it out and paint it down and it looks great. I go to bed. And then the next morning I get up and I open all the curtains and all the windows to look at my beautiful job and I look at the walls and I go, oh my goodness. And there's all these blobs that weren't sanded out and where I've painted and I thought it looked so good when I went to bed. In the dark, I can see the paint underneath bleeding through and spots that I missed and all the imperfections come to light in the presence of a brighter light. For this man, in the presence of holy Jesus on the cross, all his sin came to light. And I wonder today, have you come to that place in your life that as you look at Jesus in Scripture and as you look at Jesus on the cross this morning in this passage from Luke 23, I wonder, has God brought that to light in your heart? What do you do with that? 
You look to Jesus, the sinless one, to be your substitute. You ask him to be the one to forgive you. You realize what he's doing for you. As we read in the beginning of our time together this morning, in Romans 8 it says, God demonstrated his own love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took the wrath of God for us, but we have to respond. You see, when I asked my wife to marry me, she had to say yes. Well, she didn't have to. She did, and I'm glad she did. But, you know, when you ask someone that, and and God's done all he can do. He's extended the forgiveness. He's paid the price. He's given Jesus for you, but you've got to respond. And so this man, in saying that, he's responding to God. John chapter 16, Jesus said that he would send the Holy Spirit after his resurrection and that the Holy Spirit would convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. And it would convict of sin because we do not believe in him. We need to be convicted of sin in order to be saved. And that's what God was doing in the life of this repentant thief. And of righteousness because we don't know how we should live because Jesus isn't with us in person anymore. But the Spirit of God shows us through the Word of God how we should live. And judgment concerning sin because the prince of this world has already been judged and condemned. And you don't want to be with him. You want to be in the kingdom of God. Will you be like the first thief and continue to deny and accuse? Maybe even judge God for the way your life is right now? not realizing it's all because of sin, either your sin or someone else's sin, that the world's in its fallen condition? Or will you be like the repentant thief and ask him to forgive you of your sin? Confess your sin. Confess his righteousness. And the last thing is this. Genuine saving faith in Jesus is always marked by number three, submitting by faith to Jesus' authority and rule. This is a very important point. This is one that we don't often get across clearly in our evangelism. And so I pray this morning that you really hear this because there are many people who may believe they're saved who may not be saved because they've never done this. They may believe intellectually Jesus is the Son of God. They may have asked for forgiveness of sin, but sort of like the other thief on the cross who never really repented, they only want God to fix something in their life and then go on and live their life without submitting to his authority. Notice what he says in verse 42. This repentant thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How did Jesus respond? Jesus responded, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, the man asked to be remembered when Jesus came into his kingdom. What does that tell us? That tells us that this man believed, this man recognized that indeed Jesus was a king. And not just a king, but the king, the Messiah, the long-awaited one, the king of kings and lord of lords. And he believes that even though Jesus in this place of weakness looks hopeless, looks like you know that it's all over for him, he believes that he's the king, the king of kings. And he's saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Think about what faith that took. Think about how the Holy Spirit had to reveal that to him. Because, you see, as, as he's acknowledging that, king, his kingship, he's asking to be remembered. Jesus does something amazing. He says, I'm not just going to remember you. But today, I tell you the truth, he says, you will be with me in paradise. Wow. The Holy Spirit had obviously done a work in this repentant thief's life. And I pray that he is doing one in yours. Think about it. As we look at this Holy Week before us this week, That this thief on the cross believed in Jesus as king, as Lord, when he appeared to be the most helpless that he could have seen throughout his earthly life. He believed before the earthquake that would come when Jesus died. He believed before the temple veil was going to be torn torn when Jesus died. He believed before the resurrection. He believed before the ascension. And as far as we know, He had never seen any of the miracles of Jesus. Uh, Jesus walking on the water, healing the man born blind, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, feeding the 5,000. As far as we know, he'd never seen any of that. And in the midst of a mocking crowd, he is encountering the holiness, the righteousness of Jesus in such a way he's convicted of his sin, and he cries out to him, "To Lord, be my king. You see, when we pray to ask Christ to save us, it's not just to take away painful eternity in hell, which that certainly happens when you receive Jesus. But you're coming under his lordship. And I want to ask you this morning as we think about that, who calls the shots in your life? If you proclaim to be a Christian, shouldn't it be Jesus? 
Who calls the shots in your life? Who decides where you'll go, where you'll live, where you'll work? Who, who, who ultimately is in charge of how you spend your money and how you spend your time and how you spend your witness? Is it Jesus? Or are you still trying to run your life? You know, when I was a young man, my mom used to tell me, she used to say, George, I want you to remember this, that Jesus Christ is the only one who can run your life and not completely destroy you. You know, in John chapter 10, Jesus said, The thief, that's the devil, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and have life abundantly and full. And this morning, a lot of people are seeking joy and happiness, as I sang about in that song, Christ is All I Have. And they're looking in the wrong places. And all of it, as we've seen, can be gone just like that. Everything can change. And just like these men on the cross, their lives were over. They'd lost everything they'd had in their earthly life and they were about to lose their physical life. And this one thief, the repentant thief, I want you to think about this. His day started off really, really bad. He'd lost everything and he was about to lose his life. But before his day was over, he gained something really, really good. He gained Jesus as his Savior and the promise of eternal life with Jesus in heaven. Like the song that I sang today, as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, I looked upon, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath deserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Is that your testimony this morning? If you would pray with me now and receive Christ as your Savior, I would ask you to do that. Father, we just come before you for those that are watching online, and I pray for that person who may feel the conviction, the weight of sin that comes as we are more and more aware of the holiness and righteousness of God. I pray that they would know what to do with that, that they would confess that sin and confess Jesus is the righteous, sinless Son of God, born of a virgin, and receive Him as their King. Come under his authority, under his rule, and receive the forgiveness of sins. Lord, as they pray that now, I pray that you would give them the reassurance in their heart that God will do what he has said in his word. According to Romans chapter 10, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that means upon Jesus as master and king, shall be saved. Father, I pray for those believers today. Encourage them throughout this holy week. Not to give in to fear, but to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer with me this morning, or if you have other prayer needs in your life, we encourage you to please let us know by uh, responding to us at prayer, prayer at BethlehemNightdale.com. That will come directly to us as the three pastors of this church. And if you would like us to respond back to you, please let us know that. We'd be glad to either call you um, or email you back. But we would love to know of your decision so we can pray for you. Maybe you have other needs, prayer needs as well this morning as we have this special time. But remember, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Make sure before this day is out that you indeed have given your life to Christ, that you've chosen to be on the right side of the cross of Christ.